Welcome back to another episode here on Cap Tech. We've had a lot of requests to roll all of our true crime series about unsolved crimes in Illinois together into one hour-long special. So please enjoy this trilogy. Part one of the trilogy covers the Illinois Valley, and most specifically, the Ottawa, Illinois area. Part two of our Unsolved Cases trilogy covers Southern Illinois. And part three covers chief executive officers. I was actually hoping to make one on Chicago for part three, but there was just too much murder mystery for me to count in that neck of the woods. So I hope you will accept the CEO murder mystery edition instead of a Chicago edition to round out the trilogy. In between parts one and two, we'll have an intermission where I'll pretty much have a little aimless rant for you. And then we'll have another between parts two and three where I'll show you my latest CapTech preview video. Thanks for watching. Let's get started. Welcome back to CapTech. As you know, our channel is very eclectic, covering topics from video game reviews, a uh, fair amount of what I'd loosely deem as comedy. But well, today, we're going to take a darker turn into the true crime genre. If your head's been in the sand as of late when it comes to bad news these days, I really can't blame you. But with stories like this one coming to light recently about serial killers and yeah, in the LaSalle County, uh, Illinois Valley area, it seems like it might be time for a deeper dive into true crime um, around the greater area of Ottawa, Illinois. On August 26, Florida profiler Phil Chalmers released an episode of his podcast entitled Where the Bodies Are Buried, in which he interviewed 61-year-old convicted serial killer Delmas Colvin. In the interview, Colvin revealed he met a woman at a truck stop in LaSalle whom he murdered and left naked behind an old truck wash. Now you may already be aware that not too many years back, authorities found some burnt bodies in the Dayton area just north of Ottawa. And while this murder happened to be solved pretty quickly, um, something in this heinous and gruesome uh, happening in our neck of the woods compelled me to dive even deeper into this dark and at times even macabre uh, local history here. So let's start with the most notorious case in the history of the area, the Starved Rock Murders. On March 14, 1960, the bodies of three women from the Chicago suburbs were discovered in St. Louis Canyon in Starved Rock, one of the many uh, natural wonders uh, near Utica, Illinois. Uh, the crime shocked all of northern Illinois and led to a manhunt that snared a confessed killer. It is one of the most shocking stories to ever occur in this area. While the case is considered solved, there have been uh, some doubts raised. Although no convincing evidence presented says that Chester Weger, who was convicted, didn't do it, but ironically, no one can say that Starve Rock does not have a violent and bloody past even before this, as the investigation of the Starve Rock murders slowly moved forward. Fear gripped our entire region. Doors that were never locked before were suddenly now firmly secured. Hardware stores experienced a run on deadbolts, and sporting goods stores saw guns vanish from their cases at a staggering and alarming rate. The number of overnight guests at Starve Rock Lodge dropped off to almost nothing, and some motorists went miles out of their way to avoid dry 
arriving near the canyon entrance. Newspapers and radio across the state widely reported upon the slow progress of the investigation, which elevated the level of panic in the area. LaSalle County State's Attorney Harlan Warren a hard-working and respected public official, was technically in charge, but the state police maintained their authority in the case because the murders were committed on park property. Two law enforcement camps often clashed, but Warren was in a bind as he was forced to deal with the state authorities because the officials in LaSalle County lacked experience dealing with crimes of this manner. Using his own money, Warren eventually purchased a microscope and began intently conducting a study on the twine used in the murders. Faced with the fact that all of the lodge employees had been given polygraph tests, and had passed, Warren now had to wonder if the tests had been accurate, so he decided that it was time to run some of his own tests. Warren re recalled all of the employees who had worked during the week of the murder. One by one, they came to a small cabin located near the lodge and again submitted to the polygraph exam. The first dozen or so were quickly cleared, and Warren and the deputies wondered if they might be wasting their time. Then they brought in a former dishwasher named Chester Otto Weger and everything changed. When Weger's polygraph test was completed, Warren noticed that the examiner's face had gone pale. As soon as Weger left the cabin, the technician ended months of endless leads and wasted time when he turned to Warren and his two hand-picked deputies and quietly asserted, that's your man. But Uyghur, 21, was a slight, small man with a wife and two young children. He had worked at the park until that summer when he resigned to go into business with his father as a house painter. Police remembered the man's name from an earlier police report, but he had never made much of an impression on the investigators. Warren intensified the investigation of the man, and strangely, Uyghur happily cooperated with him. He surrendered a piece of buckskin jacket that he owned so that um, some suspicious dark stains on it could be examined. It later proved to be human blood, but in, in 1960, it could not yet be typed and matched to a specific victim. Warren also asked Uyghur to submit to further polygraph tests, and again, Uyghur agreed. He was then given an entire series of tests, and he failed them. A new problem reared its head. With all the crime and energy involved in the investigation, Warren had worked very little on his campaign for re-election. If he booked Uyghur on rape and murder charges before the election, attorneys would say he had done so as a stunt to reduce his job. So he left Uyghur under surveillance, not wanting to jeopardize the case against him with the election, was confident of his record of cleaning up gambling and prostitution out of LaSalle County during his eight previous years in office. For more of this, watch our video on Kelly and Colley and the history of organized crime. Warren let his past actions speak for themselves, but his opponent let the bungling of the Starve Rock murder case speak for him. Out of 60,000 votes cast in the election, Warren lost by nearly 3,500. Although he was disappointed by the election results, Warren still had time in office to pursue the case against Uyghur. Though his evidence was not as strong as he would have liked, he was able to obtain an arrest warrant. He believed that when he saw all of the evidence mounting against him, Uyghur would confess to the crime, to the Starve Rock murders. The confession was transcribed and signed by Uyghur. During the confession, 
when he was asked why he had dragged the bodies under an overhang in St. Louis Canyon. Uyghur said that he had spotted a small airplane flying low over the park. Uyghur then stated that he was afraid that it was a state police plane and confessed several more times to the murders over the next few days and reenacted the killings for a crowd of policemen and reporters at the canyon. Then suddenly, after his initial meeting with the court-appointed attorney, Uyghur changed his story and stated that he was innocent of all the charges, that he had been coerced into his confession by authorities threatening him with a gun. He stated that he had lied in his earlier confession and had been so scared that he signed the papers anyway. Chester Uyghur was incarcerated at the Statesville Prison in Joliet, he has been denied parole nearly two dozen times since 1972, and most feel that he belongs securely behind bars. However, in the minds of some people, there are questions uh, about the case that remain unanswered to this very day. Many feel that the evidence that was used to convict Uyghur would not stand up in court today. His prosecution largely turned out to be based on his confession, which predated the Miranda warnings from Miranda v. Arizona that are uh, now required today. Others question how a small, slight man like Uyghur could have overpowered three middle-aged women and then moved their bodies by himself to leave them hidden under a rock overhang. Others who believe in uh, Uyghur's innocence point to a deathbed confession that allegedly occurred in 1982 or 83. A Chicago police sergeant named Mark Gibson submitted an affidavit in 2006 recounted this confession. It was being used in court to support a motion for new DNA tests in the Starve Rock murder case. In the affidavit, Gibson stated that he and his police partner, now since deceased, were called in to rush St. Luke's Presbyterian Hospital to see a terminally ill patient who wanted to, quote, clear her conscience. The affidavit proclaimed that the woman was lying in a hospital bed. She indicated that when she was younger, she had been with her friends at a state park when something happened. Then the woman told Sergeant Gibson that she was at a park in Utica and things got, quote, out of hand. Multiple victims were killed and, quote, they dragged the bodies. Gibson said that the woman's daughters then cut the interview short, shouting that their mother was out of her mind and ordered the police from the room. The alleged confession was not allowed into the court hearings, although new DNA tests were ordered. However, they failed to clear Uyghur of anything because the samples had been corrupted over the years. After the attempts for release failed, a clemency petition was sent to Governor Rob Blagojevich, better known as Blago, but it was denied in June 2007. To this day, Chester Uyghur continues to maintain that he was framed for the murders. However, in November 2019, after 24 tries, Chester Uyghur was actually granted parole and has since been released from prison into a halfway house for former convicts. No matter what you may believe about the case, Uyghur confessed there was evidence connecting him to the crime and he was found guilty in a court of law, but worth noting, some, but not a majority, say he was framed. And while I can't attribute it to the now 80-plus Mr. Uyghur, uh, when he did get released in late 2019, a woman did happen coincidentally to go missing from Starve Rock in early 2020. So this is just a creepy topic once you dive in. Obviously, I'm not saying Uyghur did it, but wow, what a creepy topic. Next, let's look at a couple of cases in the area with a suspect, but with no convictions. Shortly after, 32-year-old Tracy Kusick's 2006 drowning, authorities reportedly told the city's newspaper, The Times, formerly known as The Daily Times to those of us over a certain age, that there were no uh, signs of foul play. 
Then nothing publicly happened with the case for more than two years, her family said. Flash forward, Dateline 2019, Ottawa, Illinois. A LaSalle County jury found an Ottawa man not guilty of killing his wife from back in 2006. Just a uh, reminder that this is a true story. Kenneth Cusick was accused of drowning his wife Tracy in a toilet bowl, but according to the LaSalle County News Tribune, prosecutors had witnesses testify Tracy could not have drowned accidentally. She overdosed and passed away with her face in the toilet. Her blood did come back positive for methadone, and she was known to use alcohol and drugs. It is interesting thing to note the timing in this particular case as this trial took place over a decade after Tracy died. Next case. Robert and Marcia Edwards were shot to death January 1st, 1983 in the rural Pontiac home. The Livingston County Sheriff's Office has suspected the couple's adopted son, Joseph Edwards, then 18. He then vanished without a trace despite being featured five times on America's Most Wanted. Anyone with information on the case is asked to call the uh, Livingston County uh, Sheriff's Office. A little more about Robert and Marcia Edwards' case. Here's how the story goes. With her final gasp of life, Marcia Edwards quickly wrote the name of her killer. Then, the squeeze of a trigger left her for dead in her old living room. As her life faded away, she may have heard another blast outside as the gunman shot dead her husband, Robert Edwards. Marcia actually wrote the name of Joe Edwards, who was 18 years young and their adopted son. The investigator's largest tip as to the Slayer's identity, and it remains so almost 30 years later. Joseph Sinat Edwards has been wanted ever since. All this time, the Livingston County Sheriff's Department has been stymied with very few tips and clues. Even after a generational turnover in investigators, the Edwards's murder is still said to cast a shadow in their detective room. The case has never gone away, says Sergeant Earl Dutko, detective. The force has decided to crack open evidence bags sealed from nearly three decades ago. Edwards disappeared without even a trace, but new technology might let police go back and get him and rekindle this hunt via DNA. To that extent, police have new help and have recently found Joe Edwards' birth mother, so scientists will seek to match up her genetics with any markers left at the crime scene, and if it lines up, a computer trail could possibly lead back to Edwards, you know, especially if he's committed any crimes after that. So this means that an arrest could occur because his dying adoptive mom pointed the finger of guilt his way three decades ago, while his birth mom is now helping to track him down. Not all murders can be explained even as well as this in the Illinois River Valley. And this is by no means only a recent phenomenon. Take, for example, this case from October 2nd, 76. A local farmer in unincorporated Seneca, Illinois, discovers the victim in a ditch along U.S. Route 6, one quarter mile east of the LaSalle County line. The victim had died from a gunshot wound. Artists' renderings depict a female victim. She is said to be African American. At the time of the crime, she would have been 15 to 27 years of age, 5'7" and 150 pounds. If anyone has information, please contact the deputy coroner of uh, Grundy County. Unfortunately, the mysterious murders in the Illinois Valley didn't come to an end with the Carter presidency. On March 26, 2003, seven-year-old Dalton, excuse the last name mispronunciation here, Masharik of Streeter disappeared while waiting outside of his family's home for a church van to pick him up. His body was eventually found the next day at a boat launch on the Vermilion River in rural South Streeter. Police were able to recover a three-pound short-handed sledgehammer that they believe was used in the murder. The hammer, a bench pro brand, was sold only at Kmart. Anyone with information on Dalton's murder 
hammer used in the murder or the location where Dalton's body was found made contact the Illinois State uh, Police. Dalton Masherick Task Force. At one time, there was and may still be a fifty thousand uh, dollar reward in the case. Members of the community have speculated that a family member was involved, but the mother has said that uh, she had another of her daughters go on the Steve Wilkos show just to squash those particular rumors. She told the reporter that she has an idea who killed Dalton after all these years. The next unsolved murder will examine is the Norway Jane Doe case. I remember this one. I was 16. Dateline, September 13, 1991. Found a woman's body lying face up in the southwest corner of a field one mile south of US 52 and three miles east of Norway, Illinois. Under her was a curtain with the hook still attached. The woman was Caucasian wearing a white men's style dress shirt with vertical light stripes and black and spandex uh, pants. There were no shoes or personal effects. Above her left breast was a tattoo with a blue cross with a superimposed red flower. On her abdomen was another tattoo of a flower. She had been right-handed with breast implants and might have had a hysterectomy but had never given birth or suffered a broken bone. The woman was about 5 feet 4 inches tall, weighed about 120 pounds, between 40 and 50 years old. She had been dead about 3 weeks when found. She had not been shot, stabbed, or strangled, but her system did contain more than enough cocaine to have killed her. In almost 30 years, it strikes me as odd that we know all of this information, but are still unable to uh, confirm the identity of the Norway, Illinois Jane Doe. Last but not least, the 1992 killing of Tammy Zawicki near Utica, reportedly last seen at mile marker 83 on I-80 in central Illinois between 3 and 4 p.m. on August 23, 1992. It was reported that a tractor trailer was seen near Zawicki's vehicle during this time period. The driver of the tractor trailer is described as a white male between 35 and 40 years of age, over six feet tall, with dark bushy hair. Some of the victim's personal property is known to be missing, including a camera and musical wristwatch. That day, Tammy departed Evanston, Illinois, for college in Grinnell, Iowa, where she was expected to arrive that evening. Later that day, Zawicki's car was found by an Illinois state trooper and ticketed as being abandoned. On 8-24-92, the vehicle was towed by the Illinois State Police. On that same evening, Zawicki's mother contacted the Illinois State Police and advised them that her daughter had not yet arrived at college. On 9-1-92, Zawicki's body was located along Interstate Highway 44, pronounced by the locals as, and I kid you not, Farty Far, in rural Lawrence County, Missouri which is located between Springfield and Joplin. Joplin's a big truck town in Missouri. She had been stabbed to death. The FBI and Illinois State Police believe new DNA testing technology will help reveal the killer's identity. And it is worth noting that Utica is not on the most direct route from Evanston to Grinnell, but a college student might have taken I-80 instead of 88 to avoid the tolls or the traffic, possibly. If you have information concerning this person, please contact the local office of your FBI. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe to CapTech. I promise that not all of our topics are so serious or dark. So I wanted to tell you guys about yesterday afternoon. Our power went out for no reason. Weather was fine, wasn't high wind, paid the bill, you know. So I decided I'd go for a walk. I worked from home, so I was like, well, productivity's gonna be a little low. On the my file, I'll just I'll get my exercise. I'll take, uh, go for a jog, and uh, I get tired, I'll, you know, walk back. So red van drives by me, and then stops and goes in reverse, and I'm way out in the country, right? I'm like, oh, I must know them. And it was a red van, so I thought, this must be my aunt and uncle. 
so when they pulled over, they said, oh, I didn't even recognize you because I thought it was my aunt. It looked vaguely like her. And then they're like, oh, we thought you were our grandkid. So I thought that was odd. Neither one was true. So that was awkward. So then I get all the way back home. I'm excited because the power's back on. I can uh, publish my video. Southern Illinois lockdown state where I've hybrided myself with a dog. And I was excited about this. And then my other dog runs up, who was supposed to be caged in the backyard, and uh, puts her paw on me. And she's huge, like out in the front yard where she wasn't supposed to be. And I thought, oh, man, nothing's going to shake me today. That could have been a wolf coming to get me. And it didn't even startle me. And then uh, I came back in. I stepped on one of her dog toys, and it squeaked. And I about jumped through the roof, scared. So there went my ego. And then uh, after that is when I ran into this possum in the yard that is not scared of me. Subscribe to the channel and click that like button if you like blue or if you like paint. Hey. What about uh, the other color? And do do drag. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode here on CapTech. As a follow-up to our video on infamous and unsolved crimes of the Illinois Valley, the team here at CapTech uh, next wanted to put Southern Illinois under the cold case microscope as well. Before diving into the top 10 infamous and unsolved cases of Little Egypt, first I should point out that I was closer than intended to my own Southern Illinois cold case, a story that I'll tell briefly here in efforts to set the stage prior to diving into our top 10. The year was 1996, and I was finishing my undergraduate degree at SIU Carbondale. I lived with a lovable bunch of hooligans on Elm Street in efforts to find uh, another bullet point to add to our very thin, at the time, uh, resumes. One of my roommates and I decided to uh, pledge a fraternity, despite the fact that we somewhat prided ourselves prior to that on being independent. Indie baby! The agreement we made with the fraternity was that we'd pay dues and attend events, but we were not going to take part in any other traditional hazing activities. This frat could um, charge us dues, assign us some weekly tasks, but their membership numbers um, were terrible. And as far as my roommate and I uh, were concerned, this uh, frat could help us build our resumes while we help build up their enrollment numbers. But neither my roommate or I wanted the resume bullet badly enough to do any um, true hazing. This caused some consternation um, between the real members that had to go through the actual hazing and the uh, two of us. Eventually, I saw it was not going to be a uh, good fit, but uh, my roommate pressed forward despite constantly griping, you know, about the amount of work um, and treatment being required of him to get into the uh, fraternity. Like most other Carbondale roommates, was quite the drinker. So much so that the clerks at the liquor store on uh, Carbondale's main drag there would actually heckle the guy for buying only a six-pack at a time. Like, why are you only buying six? You know, you'll be back. Anyway, to make a long story short, this quasi-frat house burned down um, in the 90s while I was there in what was believed to be an arson. The Carbondale fire chief, or at least one of his top delegates, 20-year-old me wouldn't know the difference, would go on to question my uh, roommate on the front porch of our Elm Street house one morning. I woke up to the conversation after a long night of partying. Um, it's quite sobering. I don't think uh, my roommate did it, and I certainly have no proof, but he was so darn drunk most of the time, I don't know to this day if he had, had done it. I mean, nobody died or anything. I remember asking him, and he seemed annoyed that I'd even raised the issue, and um, I was given a flippant uh, denial, and I never asked again. Now maybe you are thinking to yourself that this isn't that huge of a crime. After all, nobody was injured, the fire damage was eventually able to be repaired, and I'd be inclined to uh, agree with you on this point. But nevertheless, I wanted to share my own uh, personal Southern Illinois crime story uh, before diving into the top 10 infamous and unsolved crimes of Southern Illinois. First, let's cover another alleged arson. Dateline, 1992, Carbondale, Illinois. Sunday, December 6, 92, should have marked the end of a long weekend of holiday celebration. On Wednesday, Carla Copey recalled the Lights Fantastic Parade 
the night before the tragic Pyramid Apartments fire. With pride, she'd watch members of the International Student Council march alongside a large uh, metal globe carrying, highlight, uh, carrying lighted candles symbolizing peace on Earth. Kopi was assistant director of the International uh, Student Services at the time and was awakened hours later uh, by a phone call from her boss who asked her to, to join him at the Pyramid Apartments at 504 South Rawling Street in Carbondale. It was a very cold night, and thick smoke hung in the air over Rawling Street, Kopi said. Forever etched in my mind's eye will be the vision of the frozen columns of ice covering the charred remains of the apartment building. I knew immediately from the expressions on the faces of the firemen that students had perished. Five SIU students died in the fire. Four were international students. Several others were in critical condition, some having jumped from uh, top floors to escape the flames. Authorities believe the fire was the result of arson, but a suspect was never identified. The Carbondale Police Department lists the fire as a cold case to this day. Next, let's jump into the murder cases. If you've ever woken up after a sunset concert in Carbondale, feeling like hell, almost wishing you were dead, just be glad that you woke up at all, since Carbondale police say they are still investigating the July 13, 2006 death of Ryan Livingston. The 22-year-old was walking home from a sunset concert when he was stabbed to death by two men during an apparent robbery on West Walnut Street. Any information, call the Carbondale police. Next, Keith Brown's homicide remains open in southern Illinois. Keith Brown lived in Buckner, a small town in Franklin County, and Keith's wife reported him missing on February 3rd, 1993, and he has now been gone for over 25 years. His blue 1989 Plymouth hatchback was discovered two days later in a remote area near Crab Orchard Lake. Keith Brown's skeletal remains were found uh, near Crab Orchard Lake in June 93, but they were in a different location than his car months after he turned up missing. His remains were discovered when a farmer encountered his remains and reported them to the Williamson County Sheriff's Department. Keith had died from gunshot wounds. Keith worked as a nurse at local nursing homes. Did he anger somebody he worked with? Did he fire someone? who sought revenge. Keith enjoyed fishing at Crab Orchard Lake. Did he encounter someone at that isolated area near the lake who killed him at random? Although much time has since passed, there's someone out there that has the information needed to solve this case. And as a side note to my father, I can't believe you sent me down to school with all this stuff going on there. At the same time or right after. Anyway, next on our list. Lisa Dawn Carnes was brutally murdered in Massac County, Illinois, in March 1984. Lisa Carnes' nude body was found in a rural area near Macedonia Church Road and U.S. Highway 45. She had been brutally murdered and left to die in a rural field. Carnes' truck was later located roughly four miles from the site where her body was located. Her family tends to suspect that she knew her killer and had some connection with that killer. Three decades after her body was found in that uh, rural Massac County field, the murder of Lisa Ann Carnes remains unsolved, even though her pickup truck was found, her clothes were found between the truck and a rural country road, a large amount of blood uh, was found on a back porch of an unoccupied farmhouse while her body was found about a quarter mile away. She died from a bullet to the back. And the working theory was that she ran from the farmhouse for help and finding no one there fled through the field. Next on our list, did you ever think that crime even occurred in Collinsville, Illinois? 
an idealistic little town, home to the world's largest ketchup bottle and the horseradish festival. The rumor has that one of the Smashing Pumpkins even went to high school there, but I digress. But in Collinsville, an unidentified white female was discovered on July 20th, 1990. This unidentified white female body was found in a bean field approximately 40 feet north of Lebanon Road, a tenth of a mile west of Troy and O'Fallon Road in what is technically uh, Jarvis Township. Uh, The victim's death resulted from multiple cutting and stab wounds to the neck and torso. Her fallopian tubes, uterus, and ovaries were also missing. Evidence of surgical removal could not be determined, and no defensive wounds were even found on the victim. The body appeared to have been placed at the site two to three days prior to the discovery. Next case, on 1-30-2002, an unidentified African-American female was found near mile marker 22 on Interstate 64 in what the team over here at CapTech pronounces rural Maz Cooter. For those of you who pronounce it otherwise, the discovery of skeletal remains happened when a complaint originated from workers of the Illinois Department of Transportation, or IDOT, who were working in the area and discovered the remains. At the direction of the St. Clair County's coroner office, the remains were transferred to St. Mary's Hospital in East St., where an autopsy was performed. The autopsy, performed by James Petrachak, revealed the following information about the deceased, believed to be an African-American female, approximately 25 years old, with two rings on the left hand and a light blue-colored, tear-shaped stone in one of them, wearing a black-colored, sleeveless, one-piece Jason Matthews brand jumpsuit. The autopsy could not determine the cause of death, and it is believed that the victim had been deceased for several months. Anyone with information concerning the identity of this victim or the circumstances surrounding her death are highly urged to contact the Illinois State Police. Our next case. If you thought the worst thing about Madison County was class action lawsuits and being confused with the county that had all the bridges on it, you'd only get a silver medal here. Near the Silver Creek overpass in rural Madison County at mile marker 23 on eastbound 70, a black female victim was found on 3-11-2002. A subsequent autopsy could not determine the cause of death and it is believed that the victim had been deceased four to six months. Our next case, the Columbia Police Department and Major Case Squad, who started an investigation of skeletal remains on March 28, 2002, that were found on a creek bed on Route 3, Uh, Near Gall Road in Columbia, investigators located a size XL green shirt with with a large M and the word Maverick in orange or yellow lettering across the um, front of the shirt at the scene were a pair of khaki-colored size 3 Chaz credentials shorts. This African-American female was aged between 33 and 50 and around 5 foot 1 inches. She was believed to have delivered a child or children. The forensic examiner believed that she had been deceased at least six months, but not more than a year. This would mean that she went missing somewhere about March 2001. Someone had to have missed her. Anyone with information surrounding this crime is asked to contact the uh, Columbia Police Department. The case of Lisa Uzel isn't as old or as cold as many and maybe there was someone out there willing to uh, come forth and talk about what happened to her. She was a well-known postal worker with a uh, mail route through Marion, Illinois. She was found in late 2014 in what remained of her burning home, and she died from a gunshot wound. The fire was probably set to destroy the evidence, and it did uh, a lot of that. Her contacts could be tracked down through her cell phone, using her phone and text messages and internet usage for a 
day of her death, so maybe they will solve that one. Last case, January 1993, an unknown female found in Wayne Fitzgerald State Park in Jefferson County, referred to by the locals as Jeffco. This case is particularly interesting because the victim had a condition that would be obvious um, since only the head was located. This was uh, most likely a homicide and the rest of the body concealed somewhere else, uh, maybe even in nearby Jeffco. Post-mortem examination revealed the victim had approximately shoulder length uh, reddish brown hair. Analysis by the U of I anthropology department indicated the victim's age ranged between 30 to 50 years old. Unusual skeleton uh, remains um, of the upper skull and upper front cervical vertebrae indicate the victim suffered from chronic spasmodic torticollis or Wynek, a condition that causes stress on the muscles which are responsible for maintaining upright head posture. Evidence of a healed uh, traumatic lesion on the skull suggests this condition may have been preceded by head trauma. This would have resulted in the victim maintaining a leftward tilt of the head. Anyone with information um, that would help identify this unidentified victim is urged to contact the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department. Are you saying to yourself, Cap, was that 11 cases instead of 10? And I say, it probably was, but why don't you just add it to your list of Southern Illinois infamous and unsolved mysteries. Thanks for watching this rather macabre episode here on Cap Tech. <laughs>
prior to that, he had not made an appearance or even a post on social media since late October. Alibaba's Hong Kong listed shares surged 8.5% after the video was published, and Alibaba's New York listed stock popped by 5.5%. Ma's whereabouts had been the subject of an intense speculation recently as his group was preparing for the world's largest initial public offering last fall, Ma accused Chinese authorities of stifling innovation and blasted the country's banks for having a pawn shop mentality. Within days, regulators summoned Ma and his team of executives to a meeting and then shelved the IPO altogether. The event where Ma made those remarks was the last time he was seen publicly before very recently. This is a very noticeable absence for a man who typically has no issue with being in the spotlight. Worth noting, however, the rest of the CEOs in our video will not all be so fortunate. Ninth on our top 10 list is Tony Shea. In the hours before the fire, that killed the CEO of online shoe retailer Zappos. Two previous fires were extinguished in the shed where he slept, according to an investigator's report. At the time of recording this video, we are still unable to determine the exact cause of the fire or whether it was accidental or intentional. There was evidence that Shea was impaired or intoxicated, but it wasn't clear if that even played a role. Local police have said that there was no criminal aspect to the fire itself. Evidence found where the most recent fire started included discarded cigarettes, a marijuana pipe, liquor bottles, and nitrous oxide containers known by the street name Whip It. Shea also was using a propane heater that was found to have been partially disassembled when found by investigators. Evidence also showed that Shea, as the final fire intensified, locked himself in the shed, which was attached to the side of a friend's home. Shea had recently retired from Zappos due to mental health concerns and a, quote, midlife crisis. He was distraught over the death of his dog a few days before the fire. However, Shea was not known to have made any suicidal or homicidal statements. At about 3.20 a.m., Shea's brother Andrew, who had taken over the regular checks of Shea, knocked on the shed door and told Shea it was time to leave for the airport, but Shea asked him to come back in five minutes. When his brother and another friend went back to get him at 3.24 a.m., they discovered the fire and tried frantically to rescue him. They smashed a uh, window and tried to put out the fire with an extinguisher, but were overcome by smoke and ashes. The cause of the fire will likely remain undetermined unless new evidence emerges, officials said recently. Next on our list is Tushar Atre who was the CEO of a Santa Cruz digital marketing firm called Atre Net Incorporated. Apologies on the, what I'm sure is a mispronunciation. He was also the owner of Interstitial Systems, a Santa Cruz-based licensed cannabis manufacturer. The kidnapping and murder of this tech and devil's lettuce entrepreneur shocked the city of Santa Cruz in 2019 but it wasn't until 2020 that four defendants, including two former co-workers, were arrested and held to answer for their involvement. Atre, 50, was kidnapped from his Pleasure Point home on October 1st at 3 a.m. In the months that followed, a community-led reward of $25,000 was issued, and that was later raised to $150,000 and then ultimately $200,000 the largest amount ever offered in the history of the Santa Cruz Sheriff for any information leading to the arrest of those involved in the killing. During an update in January of this year, 2021, Santa Cruz Sheriff Jim Hart released video surveillance footage of a bicyclist 
and later Three Men Walking near Ater's Pleasure Point Drive home and said that his investigators had issued more than 30 search warrants in connection to the case. Then in May, Hart announced the arrest of four men, none of the men being held on suspicion of felony murder, robbery, and kidnapping, have had criminal histories or past law enforcement contacts, according to the authorities. The sheriff's office believes the motive for the case was a planned robbery. Officials have declined to reveal who they believed fired the shot that killed Atre. The four men have all pleaded not guilty and are expected to return to court in January. Stranger still is the case of Farim Sala, who is CEO of Gokata, an on-demand motorbike hailing service headquartered in Nigeria, who was found dismembered in his luxury apartment and he left behind quite a fortune. Sala was dubbed the Elon Musk of the developing world before the 33-year-old was found dead in his Manhattan, New York apartment in July 2020. His executive assistant, Tyrese Haspel, who lives in Brooklyn, was later arrested for being charged with the murder. Court documents are now said to have revealed that the slain CEO and investor was worth quite a huge sum. Haspel is accused of using a taser on Salah and then fatally stabbing him. It had been previously reported that he was suspected of allegedly embezzling tens of thousands of dollars from Salah. Salah's torso was found near several large plastic bags that contained his head and limbs that had been severed off with an electric saw. According to reports at the time, the power saw was still plugged in when the body was found. Haspel reportedly pleaded not guilty to first-degree murder in October, and this case is still pending. Next, please allow me to tell you about the very strange case of Aaron Valenti, the CEO of Salt Lake City-based app development company, Tinker Venture. Valenti was known to be a vibrant young startup founder who went on a work trip to Silicon Valley. Then, one week later, she was found dead in the backseat of her car. What happened remains a mystery to this day. Dateline, October 2019. On the night of her own wedding anniversary, Erin's mother, Agnes Valenti, received a call from their daughter, Aaron, who was actually calling from 2,900 miles away in beautiful Palo Alto, California, where she had just left a friend and located her rental car after some initial difficulties finding it. The 33-year-old entrepreneur then began the short drive to San Jose International Airport. She talked to her mother quickly and erratically. Some of her very last words were, it's all a game. It's a thought experiment. We're in the matrix, she said at one point, and I'm going to miss my flight. And five days later, Valenti was found dead in the back seat of a rental car on a residential street in San Jose. And according to the family, there were no clear signs of any physical harm. The mystery of how a tech founder, how a tech CEO went missing and died in Silicon Valley leaves her family and friends and a group of entrepreneurs in Utah's rising tech hub stunned. The easy explanation would be suicide, that her story was among the many stories about depression exacerbated by the stress of starting a company and trying to change the world. However, her family does not believe that she killed herself. That just wasn't who she was, they said. After all, her nickname was Armageddon Aaron because of her boisterous energy. Wait, this gets to be much weirder still. Upon researching her firm, Tinker Ventures, she left a link on her Tinker Ventures site to the following cited from Reardon Control Lab. Quote, the future of brain-machine interfaces is non-invasive 
Instead of surgical implant, Control Labs uses state-of-the-art detection and machine learning to read neurons from outside the body. The first step will be technology precisely picking up the signals from inside your body to control devices outside of it with little more than natural gesture. The next step, and we are already closer than most people realize, will be reading the intention directly from your brain. This of course raises suspicion and conspiracy theories about if she was killed for or even perhaps by what she knew. Next, we have the case of Robert Gorecki, CEO of Retro Environmental, whose body was found inside Retro Environmental in Eldersburg in May 2019. The family put up billboards throughout the region asking for information about the case. The state's attorney's office has now stated Michael Anthony Brown was arrested for the killing. Michael Anthony Brown was Robert Gorecki's son-in-law and also his business partner. He was arrested for the crime in October 2020. Dangerous to be a CEO, folks. Next on our list is a case from Malaysia. Cradle Fund Chief Executive Officer Nazrin Hassan. Hassan died in a very controversial fire in an upper bedroom in his home on the eve of the final day of Ramadan on June 14, 2018. He was 45 years old. Initially, the post-mortem report claimed that the cause of death was shrapnel from a mobile phone explosion. On 625, though, a forensic report stated the discovery of gasoline stains on his body, bed, and mobile phone, which led to the reclassification of the case as murder. Legal proceedings are still ongoing. Next up on the docket is Lin Chi, billionaire producer for Netflix and the mogul who brought us the Game of Thrones video game. He was poisoned on December 16th, 2020 and died on Christmas Day. In a plot twist that may seem taken from the Game of Thrones itself, he was reportedly poisoned by a co-worker in an alleged murder plot, Lin was the chairman and CEO of Yuzu Group, the game developer best known for uh, the Game of Thrones Winter is Coming video game. Prior to his poisoning, there were rumors of a dispute between Yuzu's executives. Zhu Yao, a senior exec in the film and television division of Yuzu, was recently arrested and charged with Lin's murder. Yao has his Juris Doctorate degree from the University of Michigan Law School and joined Yuzu in 2017. Yao allegedly poisoned Lin with a cup of tea. Shanghai police received a call from the hospital that Lin was taken to on December 17th informing them about the poisoning. Lin was at first stable and had taken himself to the hospital when he started feeling sick. He was only 39 years young. Now, before we get into our last two on the list, I wanted to give a quick disclaimer because one of these two is only a CEO in name only, and you're about to see what I mean, and the other was actually one run below CEO and was an SVP, but I thought his story was interesting enough that we'd include it anyway. Next is the very recent case from 2021 of Baby CEO, a controversial Memphis rapper. One source has now confirmed that Jonathan Brown, also known professionally as, you guessed it, Baby CEO, died in a shooting last Tuesday night. Memphis police responded, and Brown was pronounced dead at the scene. As of present, police have not yet publicly identified the victim or released any details about what happened. Rumors have also been swirling about the death being a possible overdose. 
And yet other rumors say neither of these theories holds true. Brown first made headlines in 2015 when he was only 14 years old when a video featuring him rapping about guns and drugs made the rounds on social media. Our last case, that of our only non-CEO listed, is yet another very recent story. Jake Safolia, 49, of Elmhurst, was last seen in person on August 6, 2020. He was seen on gas station footage taken the next day and reported missing August 8. His car was found at Waterfall Glen Forest Preserve in Lamont, and searches have been conducted at the park, apparently not yet yielding any clues. Elmhurst police allegedly confirmed that they were investigating Safolia when he went missing. They have not yet provided the nature of this investigation. Elmhurst police have not yet issued a news release or a photo of Safolia. After his disappearance, a source named The Patch obtained the Elmhurst police report on the missing person case, and according to these documents, Sofolia was drinking excessively and had broken up with his girlfriend in the days leading up to his disappearance. He also was said to have fantasized about going off the grid. Three Facebook pages dedicated to finding him remain, but they have become far quieter as the search has grown cold. With more than 2,000 members, the most active page entitled The Disappearance of Jake Safolia has seen only about a half dozen posts since late November. In 2018, Safolia replaced David Hilfman in the senior vice president's position. Information about Safolia, senior vice president of worldwide sales, has been removed from the section of United Airlines website about the company's leadership. It is unclear when it was taken down. We sincerely hope that you enjoyed this video. Please like, share, and of course subscribe and check out the rest of our content here on CapTech. Thank you so much for watching CapTech. I want to call your attention to our tip jar.